Um, so I watched Elephant uh, Refugees and I have to say I loved it, but I also cried. <laughs> um, first, uh, joy and what, what drew you to documentary filmmaking in general? It was my mother's fault. She wanted me, was instilled in me at a very young age that it would be a good thing for me to make a difference in the world. And I saw a documentary as a way to do that, to try to influence people and to open new vistas for them. And I like to make documentaries about people that are doing good in the world to show the humanity and the kindness that does exist. I love that. Um, and with Elephant Refugees, what inspired this project? You know, Beth, I was re working on a different project. It was called Do Elephants Go to Heaven? And I was working with an animal communicator. And I went to Elephant Refugees, which is in Botswana. It's called Elephant Sands. And I went there to get B-roll of the elephants. And when I arrived there, it was absolutely, it was, it was so unusual because there were hundreds of elephants just coming into the camp every day. It's a bush camp for tourists. And they were coming every day. And at first I thought, wow, this is so cool, so many elephants, and, and uh, they were very, elephants can be very aggressive because they've been hunted and they fear humans, but it was as if someone just sprinkled magic fairy dust on that place. And you would walk to your tent or your chalet and there was no problem. But the big problem was the lack of water. And the, as you know from watching the film, the reason they were all coming was to escape poaching. So I thought this is a more important film and that I should make it and try to help the elephants and try to get more water holes available. Yeah, I, I was watching it and like, I, I know that poaching is a big is a big issue, but I had no idea the, the additional threats that elephants face. Um, so that was really interesting uh, to take like that different angle to it. Yeah, it's amazing when President Kama of Botswana declared, you know, that Botswana was going to be a no hunting zone and no caging of animals. You couldn't even cage a pet. When he did that, you know, the word went out to all the surrounding countries there in that border Botswana and the elephants all came. But unfortunately, there's just not enough water. But now with the new government, they've implemented hunting. They're hunting up to 250 elephants a day. And Elephant Sands is now surrounded by uh, 1.1 million hectares of land, which is all hunting. So the elephants have to make their way through to try to get to some uh, much more uh, dangerous and sad situation. Yeah. Um, what was it about the, the elephants specifically that drew you into them to tell this side of their story? You know, Beth, I think it was the family that drew me in because their humanity and their sacrifice to try to help the elephants was so amazing. I mean, they, as the guests came in and paid for lodging, they were using that money to pay for water. And Ben and Mari Mola, who... who established Elephant's Hands, after they retired, there was a, an existing borehole there where the elephants for hundreds of years have been coming. Not a borehole, uh, it's a pan, a, a seep, a pan they call it. But when the hunting was outlawed, like thousands of elephants came into Botswana. And the, and the elephants, it was so tragic. I mean, at night, I would try to sleep and I would hear the babies. They are so loud and they would be screaming, trying to get to, because it's just a trough, a long trough in front of the um, in front of the lodge. So in order to get to the trough, you have to get through the big bull elephants. And normally the bulls would let the babies in, but not not the mothers. But they let the babies in, and it was just it was just heartbreaking. And sometimes you know, sometimes I'd sleep in a tent, and sometimes they'd have a chalet for me. And I a couple times with the chalet, you had a shower, but it was open to the, uh, there was no windows. And a couple times, the elephant would put his trunk right into the, right into my shower. That was pretty scary, because there's, they can just pick you up with their trunk. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And one night, I was so exhausted, it was so hot there, 
And at night, they would turn off all the water for the guests. So at 9 o'clock, if you didn't make it for a shower by 9 o'clock, you were out of luck. And I used to freeze a bottle of water and hold on to it, trying to, there was not even a fan. And it was about 130 degrees in the daytime. And one night, an elephant just punched through my wall. He just, he was uh, made of bamboo, he punched through it. And then at night, I used to leave, um, The garbage can, I would fill it with water, come and drink it. In fact, it's nothing for them. They can easily drink a bathtub. So I just felt it was so tragic, and I wanted people to know, and hopefully to, and we did get, we have had contributions, and we, we did establish seven um, additional watering sites, it, m far, far away from elephant sand, so that when the elephants go for water, there's something to eat. Because if you have all the elephants going to one location, they've eaten everything. They've pushed down every tree, they've eaten every bush. But now we're only operating three because the hunting concessions, we don't want to operate the watering hole, the elephants come, the elephants get shot. Yeah. How, how do you handle this like emotionally? Like when you're doing these projects and things are heartbreaking, how do you, how do you deal with it emotionally? That is a really, really good question. And I think for myself that I kind of have to turn off. There comes a point where you're so overwhelmed by tragedy in many of the films I make that you just have to kind of put a plexiglass up and just keep shooting and just, that, that's what I do. I don't know what other filmmakers do, but I have to kind of, I have to step back a little bit. Otherwise I, I couldn't function because it's too sad. Yeah. Um, when you film your documentaries, we, we only see the, the finished product. Um, so how, how much filming do you actually do? How much time do you immerse yourselves into these environments before you get to the finished product? <laughs> Another great question. I wish you could see all the cut footage I have. Uh, I have tons of scene and, um, you know, I shot a ton of film. I shot a couple different times there, stayed the first time four months. And um, hopefully I'll be able to put some of those scenes out on social media now that Elephant Refugees has a distributor and, and it's going out into the world. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. Um, I love elephants, my roommates I love elephants. I think we lost her. Oh no. Um, you froze on my end as well. Are you able to hear me? <laughs> there we go. Sorry, <laughs> we froze. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I noticed you froze too, so, um, but it looks like we're back. Um, all right. Um, back. So with, uh, with elephant refugees um, specifically, what, what do you hope the audience takes away from it? I think, I hope that they're moved by the um, empathy and the generosity of the Moeller family. I mean, Mari and Ben have made an incredible difference in the lives of the elephants. They've acted offered sanctuary there for about 12 years. And now their daughter Saskia joined them and their son-in-law Mike, and they're doing a great job. And I think if we all just did a little bit, it could make a big difference. And we're now going to start advocating. Ben Muller is meeting with the Minister of Wildlife, and he's advocating for a wildlife corridor. So as the elephants come into, South, into Botswana, for one example, a lot of them come out of Wanky, which is Zimbabwe. So they come from the Wanky Game Park, where there is no hunting, so they're safe, but maybe there's no water, so they come into Botswana. So he's meeting with the minister, I believe, this week or next week, and they're going to try to get a two-mile-wide uh, corridor. And so then that'll be a safe zone, and the elephants will figure that out. In a year or so, they'll all be using the corridor. There's, it's been done in other places in Africa. And I might start a petition on my website and uh, we're trying to upgrade the boreholes that we have. We have the four, and now if we had a little bit more money, we could 
Right now, they service about 600 elephants, but then they stop. They're solar. They stop pumping. So if we can upgrade them, then we could be pumping 24 hours a day, and we could service probably 16 to 2,000 elephants. So that's a big difference. Yeah. Um, really quick, can you just give us an update on elephant sands, the water crisis, and all of that, just so it's all in one place? Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's very bad. It's summer here now. And Elephant Sands, if you go on Facebook, you can look at their website, and you'll see a big pool of water in front of the uh, lodge. But unfortunately, that pool of water has been there for a while, and it's been totally polluted by the elephants. It's urine, feces, mud. So sometimes an elephant will kind of try to swish the water, you'll see, you know, to try to get something clean, but it's not drinkable. So now you've got these hundreds, literally hundreds of elephants, as you saw in the film, going to the trough to try to get the water. So it's a really, it's a dire situation right now. For two years, they didn't have any tourists, so they didn't have any money. Ben and Mari spent all their money, personal money, keeping the place going. So it, they, it's, it's not a good situation for them or for the elephants, unfortunately. Um, for those of us that aren't able to physically come to Botswana and help out and like maybe, I don't, I don't know exactly what we would do, but for those of us um, internationally, what can we do to help? Well, I think, um, it's good to be aware of what's happening. You can donate on my website for to upgrade the boreholes. If we get a petition for the Minister of Wildlife, although that won't really influence them, Botswana does what Botswana wants. And they're a great example of conservation. They've done a, a wonderful job in some areas. But now, unfortunately, you know, when you're, when you're killing the biggest elephants with the biggest tusks, then that, that affects the genetics. And now what's happening, strangely enough, is you're having more and more elephants born who don't have tusk. It's like, no tusk, you don't get hunted. But on the other hand, you, tusk are used to dig vegetable uh, ve roots, you know, to dig, uh, there's a water, they dig water, it seeps up from the ground. So just to make people aware, I mean, elephants are the gardeners of Africa. We need them and they need to have their tusks. So I don't know why hunters feel they have to go and shoot an elephant that's drinking water yeah but you know for a cup of coffee give up your starbucks for a month that would make a big difference yeah sure um to an elephant's life and um and you said the we can donate on your website yes um what is you your put in elephant refugee It'll take my website, uh, doll, D O L films, F I L M S dot org. So it stands for Dream Out Loud and dollfilms.org. Um, are you working on any other documentaries involving this topic um, at, the, at the moment? I'm working uh, back to the animal communicator doc. I started a doc called Animals Are Talking, and it's mostly featuring uh, baboons and horses. Yeah, and that's why I'm here now. There's a resident population of baboons at this location where I'm at, which is coexisting very nicely with the people that live here. And where I did most of my shooting was the Cape of uh, Good Hope down in Western Cape, where there's a terrible conflict because the uh, humans feed the baboons and then they baboons have a really interesting hierarchy you know they have um they have a very uh, uh the, the the female is born into her position she's the queen she's born as a queen whereas the male who becomes the chief the king of the tribe he has to fight his way up and then there's 
a pecking order it goes all the way down to the lowest of the low so when you give food to a baboon then you're just the lowest of the low and they want more food so they so it's, it's a really sad situation they have these guys with paintball guns who shoot them and the paintball guns really hurt and they leave big bruises I've seen it on people so we're I'm working with an animal communicator who is talking to the baboons and getting their side of the story and we're just trying to you know to <laughs> to get people to realize that their behavior is endangering the lives of the baboons. Um, that, that's really interesting. I didn't know that there were animal communicators out there. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's a lot of animal communicators. Yes, yeah. And they, they, they talk, um, you know, I, I was going going for physical therapy and I told my th therapist that she had a, oh, we, we were still there, she had a golden doodle who was dying of cancer and I said, we had a poodle, that was right, and she said, oh, yeah, I don't really believe in that. I said, well, you know, you could try. So she did and she spoke to one, someone that I recommended to her and they had this, the, the, the dog said to her, this is the one point that made her believe, he said to her, you know, I don't like it when you massage my neck all the time. She was a therapist and she was always doing that and he would kind of cringe and she thought he was enjoying it, but he didn't like it. And when she said that, when the communicator told her that, she was amazed and he just put up with it because he wanted the affection. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, there, it's been verified, animal communicators, they use them a lot with thoroughbred horses and farm animals, they can describe what's wrong with them. You should look it up, it's very interesting. There's a great documentary with uh, Anna Brettenbach. What was the name of it? It's just Anna Brettenbach, yeah. It's, it's on, the, on YouTube. We'll have to look that up. Um, all right. Um, I don't know where we're at on time, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, just, just being mindful of your time. Um, is there anything about elephant refugees that we didn't touch on that you really wanna make sure that the audience knows? Well, I think it's uh, important to know that Benny is still going to Elephant Sands. And uh, thankfully he's been in a lot of fights, <laughs> so he doesn't have much tusk left. So then he probably won't be targeted by the hunters, yeah. And, um, you know, there's a resident population that does keep returning. And Mike and Benny have a very special relationship. And um, elephants are sentient beings. They have a lot that we can learn from them. Just the family grouping and the care for each other. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of elephants and of the Molar family. Love that. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. Um, again, I loved the documentary and I'm, I'm going to look up the animal communication.